what does India's G20 presidency mean? Biggest global voices on one platform. The G20 Roundtable. Big focus on News Track. Hello and welcome. Prime Minister Modi is pitching the G20 summit as the catalyst of a new global order. What will be India's role in this emerging new order? What are the geopolitical fault lines that can help India's rise? And what are the divisions which can hold India back? To talk about the most important foreign affairs issues of the moment, I am delighted to be joined on India Today's news track by three super sharp global thinkers and strategists. Let me begin by introducing Ian Bremer. Ian Bremer is the president of the Eurasia Group. He's one of the world's top experts on global political risk. He's the author of Every Nation for Itself, Winners and Losers in a G0 World. Kishore Mehbubani is the former president of the United Nations Security Council. He's an acclaimed Singaporean diplomat, geopolitical consultant and author of the book Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy. For an Indian point of view, I am joined by Samir Saran, President of the Observer Research Foundation. He's the co-author of the book, The New World Disorder and the Indian Imperative. Ian, Kishore, Samir, welcome to this special G20 International Roundtable. I am delighted that we could have all three of you together with your differing perspectives live at the same time. Ian Bremer, I want to start by asking you about Chinese President Xi Jinping's decision to skip the G20 summit in the capital. He went to Johannesburg for the BRICS summit. He's giving the G20 a miss. Why do you think the Chinese president has decided he doesn't want to be at Prime Minister Modi's G20 Jamburi? Look, uh, first of all, delighted to join you uh, and my esteemed colleagues uh, today. I can't think of a, a better global platform to be talking about the G20 than this one. Uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government had let the Indian government aware, uh, know that they weren't going to come at least a month ago. So it's not news, uh, even though it's uh, headlines presently. Uh, apparently, the Chinese government is saying it is in part, at least, uh, because of difficulties in the bilateral relationship between China and India. Um, in other words, this is not a sudden reaction uh, to difficulties at home economically for China. As, as we've seen, the Chinese were very happy uh, to be, from their perspective, headlining uh, the BRICS summit. There were diplomatic gains. Uh, China was pushing hard to expand the BRICS. Six countries uh, invited. Argentina probably won't eventually join, but the others will. Um, but it, it, it's, it's certainly true that the Chinese prefer architecture that they feel like they have a handle on than one where they're one player of many. And in the case of the G20, specifically the G20 chaired uh, by Modi and by India, uh, that's less attractive uh, to the Chinese. I, I don't think the fact that Xi Jinping and Putin are not going to be attending in person, in my view, does not significantly detract from the importance of this summit. Samir Saran, from an Indian point of view, what do you think is the message uh, Xi Jinping, who's been described by some international authors as now having an emperor-like mindset. What's the message that you think he's sending to Prime Minister Modi and to India? So, Rahul, thank you for having us. And I think it's a fantastic panel. Great to be with Ian and uh, Kishore. I don't know what his message is, but let me tell you the message I'm getting. The message I'm taking from his uh, no-show is that he feels that at the G20, he'd be a small man in a very big table of peers and he would uh, prefer to be uh, in different company and I think it reflects on his own uh, place in the world, his own assessment of his place in the world today that he uh, feels less comfortable in big rooms such as the G20. Uh, I would also argue that it's also as much about their own economic troubles and the China project which is today far more shaky than it was even at the peak of the pandemic. Um, the, uh, the expectations that 2023 would see China resurgent and uh, dominating the world once again has not proved true. And we know that uh, there's more to hide than to, to bear uh, as far as the Chinese story is going. And finally, uh, the political project, uh, the redrawing of the, uh, the power structures in Asia, 
the political project that Xi Jinping has invested into. This is a big roadblock, and that roadblock is India. And uh, uh, I hear I agree with him that uh, uh, he would uh, possibly uh, see this uh, G20 edition as being even less embracing of his worldview uh, than uh, any other edition. And he has chosen not to come. Uh, okay. But like he mentioned, uh, his loss, um, the G20 is uh, a, a process now. It is not based on the final meeting of the leaders. Uh, I think what the Indian presidency has done remarkably well, it has made every day of the G20 presidency count. It has had a normative impact on other global processes. And the one day without Xi would, possi would possibly be a good day for the world. Kishore Mehbubani, Xi Jinping has tried in his terms as president to be a player on the global stage. The G20 so far was seen as being important to him. Uh, in your reading, why is it that she is not coming? Does that in time to come then undermine the importance of the G20 as the primary uh, platform where key international economic decisions were being taken so far? Well, I'm sure there, there are lots of reasons. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for including me, my friends, Ian Bremer and Samir Saran. Uh, firstly, clearly, I think as Ian was also said, this is an indication that relations between China and India still remain very troubled. And I can tell you, by the way, that we in Southeast Asia are very worried about this, because for us, the future of Asia depends on good relations between China and India. And the better the relations are, the better for Southeast Asia. The more difficult the relations are, they, they're not so good for Southeast Asia. So that clearly is one indicator. But the second point here is that, you know, I, I was in Bali last year, a few days before the G20 meeting in Bali, and President Jokowi, the host, at home, uh, invited me for breakfast. And when he asked me at the breakfast uh, and said, what, what should I try to accomplish at the G20 meeting in Bali a year ago? I said to him, President Jokowi, if you can organize a good meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden, the world will be very grateful to you because, you know, at that time, as you know, relations between U.S. and China were extremely bad and there, were, there weren't even all this business that had taken place since then of Blinken, Yellen and so on and so forth. And I said to him, if you can organize a good meeting between uh, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping, the world will be grateful to you. And he said to me, don't worry. I've given them the best room in Bali for this meeting. And sure enough, as you know, President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden had a good meeting. The reason I tell that story is that there is now less urgency uh, in a meeting between President Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. Relations have stabilized a bit. And also, by the way, the President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden will probably meet at the APEC uh, summit in the United States. So there's another occasion for them to meet. But the, the third point I want to make here is that the G20 process will still remain important. I mean, let's be very clear about this. Of all the bodies in the world today, the most important is the G20 mm -hmm. because it's the most representative global body. It's the only one that brings the, you know, the, the North and the South together. And here, the most important point everyone should know about the G20 meetings is that this is a long process. This is part of a restructuring of the world order. We have to readjust the amount of power that the West has in the global scene and bring it down to a level commensurate with 12% of the world's population. And, and you need to increase the voice and influence of the global South. And here I must say the best thing that Prime Minister Modi is doing at the G20 meeting is that he wants to inject heavily the voice of the global South I think that's the right thing to do in India. Ian Bremer, share with our viewers your reading of China's economic situation at the moment. We saw unemployment amongst the youth hit 21% in June, after which data went black. Uh, one sense is that this is an economic wobble. The other is with what's happened with Country Garden and other companies in the real estate sector, China could be facing its most serious economic crisis. Uh, what's your reading of just how bad the economic situation in China is, Ian? Well, I, I think the situation is, of course, very troubling. And internally in China, they're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how much stimulus they should engage in without just creating more bubbles, as they feel like they have historically. The approach is incremental. Xi Jinping is not surrounded by a bunch of reformers uh, right now. 
And once he's made a decision, it takes an overwhelming amount of evidence to move him off of it. We saw that with the end of zero COVID. He sticks with it, he sticks with it, he sticks with it until it gets really bad, and then suddenly he ends it immediately. And so this economic slowdown is going to need to get a lot worse uh, before the Chinese government is going to be prepared to act with a significant effort uh, domestically. And I, so I think for the end of 2023, we're going to be continuing to ask this question. China's performance is going to be very low. But, but I also take on board the fact, and, and Prime Minister Modi said this uh, in your interview with him on the G20, uh, the fact that uh, India, of course, has much better trajectory right now, has much higher growth right now uh, than China does, and everyone's excited about it. It's a great shiny object. But India should have been making the policy moves they're making right now 40 years ago. Modi said that. Uh, China has been. So let's recognize that China is the second largest economy in the world. It has immense drive from a manufacturing perspective, new technologies, uh, whether it's solar and critical minerals development or nuclear, um, biotech, AI, you name it. They are well, well ahead of India. And, and even though there are big problems in China and rule of law is essentially non-existent, so there are big risks around investing in China, it doesn't mean that suddenly they're less relevant and India is now critical on the global stage. You've got 40 years of history to make up for. Sure. Uh, Samir, throughout India's tenure as the chair of the G20, China seems to have worked to obstruct and challenge India's leadership in some way or the other, from small things like opposing Vasudev Kutambakam uh, to, you know, on issues like Russia, Ukraine, climate change, energy policies. China in various ministerial meetings has been described as adopting obstructive tactics. Why do you think they've had this role, given the fact that in Bali there was a joint declaration, a joint communique that all countries agreed to, whereas in all our ministerial meetings, we've struggled because of this kind of obstructionist attitude in coming up with language which everyone agrees on? Now, uh, let's be clear, even in Indonesia, the only communique that came out was a leader's communique. Everything else was a chair statement, and it's no different in the Indian presidency. So we are following pretty much the same uh, formula this year uh, uh, until now. We'll of course have to see whether we get a communique out when the leaders meet. The Indonesians could manage that, but as a European diplomat observed this morning in one of the papers, uh, this time both sides, uh, EU and Russia, uh, EU and uh, US on the one hand, and uh, China and Russia on the other, seem to be more entrenched and far more ideological in um, the disagreement that. Uh, currently uh, is, a, is, is uh, on a particular formulation on uh, the conflict. So uh, uh, we did not see any communiques come out before the leaders' summit, even in the Indonesian presidency. Uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, the Chinese uh, see this as a political moment to minimize uh, progress under the Indian presidency, not realizing that uh, in the Sherpa track, where all the ministerial and other engagement groups meet, um, most of the work that happens is on a, a shaping role. Uh, they don't have executive powers to enforce any uh, progress, either on climate or on gender or on health or on any other matter. These are only discussions and discursive forums where ideas for the future are taken to the forums that have the executive ability to implement them, like, for example, the COP28, which is uh, happening in UAE in a few months' time. So uh, whether uh, uh, you achieve a communique or not, you can achieve agreements amongst the most influential actors who can then take this back to the main forums where the matter will be mediated and, and discussed and, and agreed upon. So that's one part of the answer. Here. I just want to pick up something that um, uh, Kishore mentioned, very important point. I think uh, what India has done uh, very well uh, is uh, that it has actually changed the nature and texture of the G20. Uh, I call it the people's G20. It has been taken to every nook and corner of the country, but more importantly, it has engaged with a, a vast array of groups, students, academics, civil society actors, farmers, fishermen, fisherwomen, um, all sorts of communities, you know, a women-led growth model, a tech for development model. We have had a plethora of minds and, and actors participate. Millions and millions of Indians have participated. They have got their counterparts from other G20 countries into the discussions as well. G20 will never be the same again. 
it will never be this high table where only the high and mighty meet and discuss matters that are not relatable to people. India has brought people into the rooms. It has also made the rooms more relatable to issues that matter to people. And it has, of course, as Kishore rightly mentioned, it has made Global South uh, uh, um, a visible participant in the process of the G20. Uh, so I think uh, that has been the single biggest contribution. Ian is right. China was uh, this GDP 15 years ago. Uh, the Indian GDP size today is China 15 years ago. Um, uh, it's a 15-year gap between the two countries. Um, uh, we should not be over-leveraging uh, uh, the, the India story, but we must realize that the India story is now on its way. It should have started 40 years ago. Maybe it is 40 years late, but the trajectory over the past few years gives me hope that in the next 15 to 18 years, we would pretty much be where China is today. And that would be a remarkable transformation uh, that um, uh, people that that you know brilliant minds like Ian would have to contribute to, but also will also have to critically analyze because it is going to change the world. The movement from three and a half to fifteen billion dollars is going to uh, absolutely create a, a, a new um, the basis for managing much of what the world today uh, is engaged in. Kishore so, Mehwani, uh, I want to spend a moment on the mindset at this moment of the Chinese president. I want to quote to you what Alfred Wu, associate professor at the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy said. He's describing Xi as being in an emperor mindset, who's expecting dignitaries to come to him. Leaders from Germany, France, four senior Biden administration lieutenants have visited Beijing since China lifted COVID-19 controls. He's essentially saying he enjoys the high status when he's receiving guests at home. In the policy moves that Xi Jinping has made uh, during COVID and post, you know, what's the mindset uh, that you're picking up at the moment? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, China is one of the most difficult countries to understand. And I've tried my best to understand it. And so, for example, if you take the short term, uh, Ian, Ian Bremer is right. Uh, 2023 will be a difficult year for China for many reasons. Very difficult year. But what's going to happen in 2024, 2025? And I can tell you the conventional wisdom in the Western media is that, oh, the China growth story is over, the people are tired, they're disillusioned. But you know, there was also a story, by the way, in the Financial Times pointing out that the more dynamic sectors of China's economy continue to function very well, and China has overtaken Japan as the number one exporter of cars. So that, that in China is complex, sorry. There are, and, and you know, when you, when, and I'm really glad that India's economy is going to do very well. I share the optimism of uh, Samir. It'd be wonderful for the world when India takes off too. But you know, the global supply chain story, again, is something you cannot replicate what China has done overnight. It'll take a decade or more to do that. But your fundamental question is, what is the f core thing in the Chinese mind? And there, there's a very simple answer. The core element in the Chinese mind is the century of humiliation that China suffered from 1842 to 1949. And if there's one psychological force that is thrusting China forward, it's the memories of the century of humiliation. And therefore, the Chinese have learned profound lessons as to why they got slapped by the West for 100 years effortlessly. And one of the lessons they learned, by the way, is that the reason why China collapsed is because it closed itself up, literally. So how does China come out? The answer is that the Chinese economy must remain open to the rest of the world. But you heard what the U.S. Commerce Secretary said during her visit uh, to China recently, where she said because of the haphazard ad hoc economic policies, China is becoming increasingly uninvestable for international firms. Well, I can tell you it's very simple. Go back to her statement one year from now, go back to her statement two years from now and then watch the investment figures now it is true by the way eh, that the i think ian can ian probably has the latest data the flow of new investment 
foreign investment into China has slowed down for many reasons, COVID and other reasons. But if you look at the investment in China, by companies inside China, are they reinvesting in China? And the answer is yes, they are. I mean, look at Tesla, okay? Tesla is one of the most successful companies in the world. What is Tesla doing? Tesla is betting on China. So, you know, they are, they are, it's, the Chinese story is very, very complicated. And, and it's, it's a huge mistake to simplify it in any kind of way. But I can tell you also, and this is the one lesson I learned after studying China for 40 years or so, is never underestimate China. They have outperformed over 40 years against all expectations. It's safer to bet on a successful China. And then we have to deal okay. with a stronger China. And how the question is asked, how do we deal with that stronger China? Uh, Ian Bremer, I'm very curious to know what you think about a comment made by someone you know well, Borgia Brande, uh, the president of the World Economic Forum. He was at the Business Today India at 100 uh, Summit recently. And in an interview I did with him, he said that in the next 10 years, the Indian economy will be $10 trillion. And he sees the emergence of a new world order, which will be defined by what he called the G3, the US, China, and India. Now, your book is G0. Uh, which is about each country pulling for itself. And in that context, I wonder what you think of Borge Brande's uh, comments about a G3. Well, I'll get to that. I want to quickly uh, offer a rejoinder uh, to what my friend Kishore was just saying, um, which is that, uh, of course, we don't want to simplify the Chinese economy. Uh, but we do want to go back to what uh, Secretary Raimondo uh, just said in another year, two years, three years, about how many people believe that China is increasingly uninvestable because Chinese labor, remember, the last 40 years of extraordinary Chinese growth came because China had unprecedented, inexpensive, productive labor that was essential. It became the factory of the world. That is no longer the case. Chinese labor is more expensive than Mexican labor today, in part because of the extraordinary growth. Um, Chinese domestic competition is much more challenging in a legal environment that is not markedly more open. That's making Western firms less interested. Um, and the Chinese demographic uh, situation is, is appallingly bad um, for a middle-income country. I mean, you, you imagine it in South Korea or Japan, but not for a country that's only making $12,000 per capita. So all of these things are going to make China more challenging in terms of their growth story for the next three, five, 10 years, even if the US-China relationship remains relatively calm and steady. And that is a big assumption going forward. So I'm, I am more concerned uh, than I have been for a long term uh, for, the, for where China is going. That does play into my view of whether or not we're heading into a G3. Uh, I think the world is more complicated than that. Uh, we've been talking about the G20 on today's show, but of course, at the same time as the G20, which is the most important in the sense of being most inclusive among the largest countries out there, but the most impactful uh, summits uh, increasingly are the G7. And that's because the United States leads it. It is more cohesive. It is more coordinated. Um, and and these, these countries uh, are increasingly sharing a worldview. Um, that means that the BRICS, with China much more comfortable attending it, um, they're trying to make that a different order uh, uh, that, that has the Chinese and the global south together. And, and certainly, I see. Uh, an environment that's going to be much more complicated than G3. I see one where the Americans are dominating the security order that feels like a G1 still with a bunch of rogues that don't participate. Um, I see, and I think the India-US relationship and the new architecture in Asia around the Quad is a big piece of that. I think that economically, which is what uh, Borga is talking about, um, there, there will probably be something that is more G3-like, but also with the EU as a principal player. I don't, I'm a little surprised that he didn't include the EU in that formulation, especially given where the West, 
is headquartered um, <laughs> and because I see it as being more cohesive and coordinated over time, not less. But then there's a technology order, a digital order, and it's not clear that that's a G anything. It may well be a technopolar order where technology companies, not governments, are actually driving outcomes. And that, that's, a, that's a dangerous geopolitical development. So, I mean, I don't think the G0 is going to persist for long, uh, but I think what replaces it is, is a lot more nuanced and complex uh, than the idea of a G3. Samir Saran, everyone watching at this moment would be delighted with the idea that there's a G3 emerging, but then they'd uh, advise caution and say, let's not get carried away by the hype as India often tends to overpromise and underdeliver. In your reading of the situation, could Borgay be right about the emergence in the next 10 years of a new world order defined by the G3? Or was he just pandering to the domestic Indian constituency, given that that's where he was speaking, which is why, as Ian mentioned, he left Europe out of that formulation? So the good thing about India, Rahul, is that we can make an assertion about India that is true, and the opposite is also equally true. So, um, I think uh, perhaps uh, what we really need to be thinking about is uh, the big question that, uh, 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 that uh, Ian has posed before all of us. That could we have all of this, we still have a G0 world because no one is really in control. And I think it's probably going to be a sectoral and domain focused uh, influence of, uh, of uh, different actors at different points of time. But collectively, are we still going to see what my book promises a new world disorder? And I think that's the big question that a G0 world and a G3 world are not contradictory. You could have a G0 world and still have four or five big countries with their influence operations in different domains and sectors. And I think we are probably going to see a, world, a, a kaleidoscope of all of that play out in the coming uh, decade. I just want to reiterate one point. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I agree with Kishore. It's a complex country. It's not easy to make pronouncements. But Ian is right. An old China, an aging China, a China without sufficient people, with costly labor, is not the China of the previous two and a half decades. I think that's the story that's playing out in China. That can an aging China have the same resilience and resurgence uh, that it has remarkably shown in its four decades of growth uh, in the future? Can we project that into the future? And I think that's the big if. And uh, uh, to me, uh, India is certainly a bright spot, contributing 15% of growth this year, 15% of global growth with a GDP that's uh, close to 5% global GDP. So we are certainly a bright spot. But we require to be relentless in investing in infrastructure, industry, opening up, and, and making ourselves investable. And so I think the India story is, which lies ahead is about continuously doing more, doing it better, doing it faster, and doing the simple things right. We don't have to be complex. We need the roads and the bridges and the ports and sensible laws, and we are there. But we need to do this with single-minded focus in the days ahead. We could be G3, we could certainly be part of any grouping that organizes the world in the future. EU is a big actor. EU will be a partner with India. Both of us don't want the G2 world. Uh, both of us want a world where we should be able to uh, make alignments based on interests and values and, and, and what suits us. So I think the EU is difficult to ignore and would be part of any formulation for the future. Okay, so both Ian and... Uh... Samir pushing back against Kishore Mehbubani's idea that China will bounce back to say that the factors that propel China's growth over the past four decades are different from the world internally and externally. An aging population, smaller workforce, the fact that with a China plus one pivot, a lot of companies now wanting to look outside China uh, and build resilience in their value chains. And therefore, a lot of estimates now say that China may possibly never become the number one economy. Even if it does, it will happen at a much later stage than was initially being predicted. Kishore Mehbubani, you've always been, especially from an Indian point of view, very soft on China and very tough on India. Well, the, um, you know, the number one, I would say that what makes me unusual is that I'm bullish on both India uh, and China and people often make a choice. Now, you know, the story on China, if, if you, all you have to do is go back and read what the Anglo-Saxon media told you 10 years ago of how the China story is over. It's a constant theme. It's a, it's a constant theme. 
You don't think this time is different because of the factors that Ian just mentioned? Well, the, you know, there are answers to every one of the points you made. Now, let me give you a simple answer. Let me give you, let me give you a simple answer. You know, China is producing the largest number of robots in the world. The largest number. Now, that's a, clearly an answer that they saw long time ago to the fact that the labor force is diminishing. China is also producing the largest number of graduates in STEM, science technology, right? And China has surpassed everyone's expectations. When the United States cut off exploration on space with China, how did China perform? It set up its own international space station. I, I'm only saying this, by the way, if China performs as badly as Ian says it is going to perform, we have nothing to worry. China, the story is over. But what happens if my predictions come true? And you'll find out in five to 10 years. And China really becomes the number one economy in the world, then it's a different world. And we have to psychologically consider what that kind of world is. And by the way, surprisingly, I agree with Ian Bremer that it won't be a G3 world. It'll be a very complex world. There'll be many shapes and nuances, lots of players, lots of players, including, by the way, ASEAN uh, in Southeast Asia, including the African Union. And I can tell you, Russia will play a role too. So it'll be a very complex world. And the simple black and white divisions that we make will no longer operate in the world. And I must say, the one thing I have to disagree with Ian Bremer is about the G7. It's a sunset organization. <laughs> it represents the past. It's a postcard from the past. People will laugh at the G7 10 years from now when they continue meeting. Come on, let's get serious. The world has changed fundamentally. You know, the reason why my book, The Asian 21st Century, has been downloaded 3.2 million times in 160 countries is because the world is psychologically preparing for the Asian century, which includes India in a very big way. Ian Bremer, the there's a pitch for downloading the book, but that aside, uh, this uh, I, I want to give you a moment to respond to the idea of the G7 being a sunset platform that the days, the best days of just G7 are behind them and respond to Kishore Mahbubani's point about if all the prognosis about China's doom is wrong, then in the next five to ten years, the world will be looking at a very different kind of world order, which will be led and determined by China, he says. I mean, it, it is surprising to see um, the level of willingness of Kishore to accept uncertainty around China, and I agree with him on that, and have such certainty around the idea that the G7 is history. That, that I, I don't know where you get that level of certainty and lack of nuance um, about, about the United States and the core allies among the advanced industrial uh, democracies. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with that level of confidence. I just don't know where it comes from. Um, I, I don't know that the G7 is history. I think the challenges that China faces and that the United States as the world's largest economy uh, face are very different. The Chinese challenges are overwhelmingly about their economic system, about the stage of globalization, about their demographics, um, about state capitalism and its efficiency. Uh, the challenges in the United States are not economic challenges. Um, they are political challenges. And they are perhaps equally dangerous and grave as China's economic challenges. It's not clear that the United States has a sustainable representative democracy. It's not clear that its citizens believe in America's political system or its allies believe in America's political system the way it's not clear that Chinese uh, believe in the Chinese economic system uh, going forward. Um, and and I, I think that that's going to be the biggest question about the strength of the G7, uh, is whether the Americans are prepared to continue to play uh, a leadership role. What kind of outcome do we see from the 2024 U.S. election, which is a train wreck? 
waiting to happen and with very few signs of pushback domestically. So, I mean, clearly following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, something we haven't discussed yet, but that's been occupying the G7 very strongly and not the G20 uh, over the last uh, 500 days, uh, you have an enormous level of leadership and coordination among all of those allies. And it's even bringing Asian allies closer uh, to the G7, closer to NATO as a consequence. Will that still be true in another two years? There's a huge uncertainty there, easily as big as the uncertainty as China's economic performance going forward. And I think we just don't know. I think we have reasons to be skeptical about the future trajectory of the G7. They are largely political and they are similar in scope to the reasons we have to be skeptical about China's economic development. In both cases, big things need to change if we want to continue to see success. And right now, we're not seeing any assessment in the U.S. political system or in the Chinese economic system that those big changes are coming. Let's spend a moment on the Russia-Ukraine war, Samir, because when we interviewed the Prime Minister for Business today, one of the things he said is that, you know, there are other issues on which there can be convergence. Amitabh Khan, the G20 Sherpa, said, let's focus on what unites us, not what divides us. However, the German Sherpa for the G20 has said, how can you have a G20 without spending substantial time, energy and effort talking about the Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, do you see the dynamic pull playing out over the Russia-Ukraine war derail any attempt India may make to have a joint communique, to have tangible outcomes at the end of the G20 leaders summit? How should India be playing it on the back of the Sherpas meeting and right before the leader summit begins? Look, Rahul, as a host and as a platform provider for the G20, India has to, uh, in many ways, find the sweet spot that allows all participants to feel that their viewpoint has been captured and reflected in the final communique if it is to be signed by all. And uh, here, uh, it will have to use its uh, persuasive powers uh, to, to come up with a, a wording or a, or a draft that works for all. Uh, having said that, I think the G20, where the biggest countries sit, uh, is a platform that over the years has confronted uh, a few crises, right? Uh, it was shaped during the crisis. In, in many ways, the G20 was elevated to a leaders' summit uh, in the midst of a crisis. And uh, anything that impacts the globe, uh, the G20 will have to deal with. So I think uh, there is a there is a it's a fair thing to say that while it was not designed to be responding to uh, a, a crisis such as the one that is unfolding in Ukraine, it it has not been impervious to the in, to the implications of that conflict. And uh, countries that are affected and countries that are uh, 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 indeed uh, proximate to that conflict. Uh, are going to be viewing the world and issues through that particular prism. And we have had to face those headwinds. I think India has done pretty well, as uh, uh, possibly Ian also acknowledged, that despite uh, many issues uh, and, and, and the urgent uh, and emotive uh, 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 interventions on this subject by many European and, uh, and uh, 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 integrators from the Atlantic system, we have been able to still focus on uh, questions of development, growth, uh, climate, and and uh, uh, other important issues. So uh, the presidency has done well uh, to take forward the discussions on matters uh, that are important to everyone. Uh, it has, of course, uh, also grappled with finding that wording that will uh, be uh, uh, that will work with both parties or both sides uh, 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 by describing the conflict in the community and in various other statements. Uh, I hope we'll be able to uh, to uh, find a resolution on that particular front and have a communicate that comes out. Because uh, to me, as we head into that summit, uh, this particular presidency has used the bully pulpit to shine a torch on what matters to 7 billion people who have not yet been served by global governments. If the world has, the globalization has served 1 billion people, well, many Indian and Chinese amongst them, the next 7 billion need to be served. G20 is the best forum to do it. And I think the last 10 months, of the G20 presidency have been spent on serving uh, these 7 billion. One short point, Rahul, I must come in. I think uh, the challenges for democracies like US and India is uh, 
to, to create political convergence among societies so that the big national projects can be taken forward. Uh, the challenge for countries like China is to allow diversity and heterogeneity in their leadership. I think one of the biggest challenges to China's resilience is not just aging, but it's also uh, the, the small coterie that is now running China under Xi Jinping. The Communist Party of China was able to create a diversity of views in their standing committees and in their leadership. The Chinese have eliminated that. The fragility of a single point of thinking is what is now playing out in China. I think Ian mentioned uh, COVID, uh, the COVID reopening or the post-COVID reopening of the economy. But you see the missteps coming in sure. precisely because no one brings in a different thinking into that room where the emperor sits. And the emperor today has a lonely cabinet. Uh, interesting. Ian Bremer, the Economist Intelligence Unit, had a piece out which basically spoke of how economic agreement is becoming increasingly difficult for the G20, hamstrung as it is by geopolitical differences, and how the failure to issue a declaration would suggest that the G20 could be losing viability into the going into the future as the preeminent organization of the world. Would you buy that? How much emphasis would you lay on the need for India as president to produce a communique at the end of these deliberations? Uh, look, obviously it's important to show that the summit is a success, uh, but I don't think that's the only metric that we judge it by. I, I agree with Samir uh, that uh, it is uh, essential uh, that the 7 billion people that have not been served by a global governance and architecture uh, have spokespeople uh, that are able to drive their interests and force them on the global agenda. And India's chairmanship of the G20 is a significant step in that direction. So in that regard, the issues that are being driven by the Indian government are very important on financing, for example, for climate change. And I see the G20 as potentially more impactful on that than this year's COP summit um, in Abu Dhabi because of the controversy around it. Uh, lots of other issues uh, in that regard. But one thing we have not mentioned, again, I mentioned Russia, Ukraine briefly, and of course, Modi doesn't want to discuss it, and he says that's only driving countries apart. It's true, but let's be clear. Uh, this is the Russian invasion of Ukraine is not important so much because of Ukraine for the G20. It's important because it's the first time that one of the G20 nations has been made into a rogue by the entire G7. Saudi Arabia approximated that, came close to that, much smaller economy and much less holistic willingness to toss them out after the Khashoggi incident. This is a wholly different concept. This is the G7 taking, in other words, a big component of the G20 saying, your, one of your members is led by a war criminal and we can no longer work with them. And I agree um, that Russia is still going to be, as Kishore said, an important country in the world. It's just going to be an important country that is seen as a war criminal. Uh, that's a real problem for the G20. That's a real problem for the development of the global economy. I mean, for gas flows, for food, for fertilizer. There's a deal that they're trying to get back on the table today with Turkey, unlikely to occur. And so the, the interference of geopolitical trends, of which the biggest near-term crisis has been the Russian invasion, but there are many, many more, with economic development is a principal spanner in the works of how we can continue to drive cooperation in the face of really big global challenges. You need global responses, but nobody believes that we have effective global responses right now, not to COVID, not to climate, not to technology, not to the Russia war. Um, and that's a very, very principal challenge, not just for the G20. I'm running out of time on this round table, but I, have, I want to go across for one final question each. And Kishore Mehbubani, I'll start with you. One of Prime Minister Modi's big attempts has been to position India as the voice of the global south during his G20 presidency. Now, China, over the past several years, has been working towards emerging as the leader of the global south. Is this where an India-China contestation is now shaping up, where India, through its efforts to onboard the African Union as a permanent member of the G20, is trying to give the global south a voice, whereas China sees itself as the natural leader of the global south? How do you see this play out? 
Well, I think it's good that both China and India are competing to be leaders uh, of the Global South because the voice of the Global South, as Samir uh, said very clearly earlier, has not been heard. And you know, you asked about Ukraine earlier. You know, you interviewed Prime Minister Modi. And I remember in the, in the interview, you asked Prime Minister Modi, what are you going to do about Ukraine? And what was Prime Minister Modi's response? He says, why do you mention Ukraine only? Aren't there wars in Syria? Aren't there wars in Libya? Aren't there wars in other parts of the world? Why do you focus on one war? And he said, this is where, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar was very wise. He said, Europe thinks. But Europe's problems are the world's problems. But the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That's why it's good that India is vying for leadership of the Global South because there's so many more issues than Ukraine in the world. Yes, Ukraine is important. But come on, 88% of the world's population lives outside the West. And 85% of the world's population has not imposed sanctions on Russia. Interesting. I want to go to Samir on the issue of the BRICS and the SEO. India at this moment is in this uh, position where its president of the G20 is a key part of the Quad, is furthering ties with the United States and yet is a member of the SEO which obviously they didn't put the kind of soul into uh, because the SEO summit this year was held virtually by India. We are part of BRICS which has now been expanded. At some point in time, Samir, do you see India having to choose between, say, being a part of the Quad, being a part of the G20 and wanting to continue playing a role in the SEO or BRICS, which China clearly wants to dominate and set the agenda for? So, Rahul, I want to come to that question. It's a, it's a great question. Let me answer that. But before that, I just want to add something to uh, points made both by Ian and Kishore. You know, uh, let's put a counterfactual here. Just just a thought, uh, and I'll leave it there. Uh, let, let, let us all come up with our own answers. If the invasion of Iraq by George Bush Jr. had taken place a few years ago and the leaders' summit of the G20 was already underway, actually when the invasion took place, G20 at the leaders' level did not exist. But if it had happened in the last few years, how would George Bush have been treated by the G20? And that's, that's just a thought we should all process. How would the world have responded to uh, a, a blatantly uh, uh, unfair war imposed on uh, a proud people, the destruction of the country? And that's something we must think about. Would we have responded in the same way? And if we did, then perhaps uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we are in the right direction. If we, we would have responded differently, then we are just letting our biases play out. That's just one thought, uh, Rahul. On the BRICS and SEO, uh, on the BRICS, and both of them are very different organizations. SEO, we are a late joiner. And I think uh, uh, simply because of our, our presence in a particular region, we need to be in the tent rather than outside of the tent. What SEO does for that implications on our security and on our economic prospects, we need to be within that grouping, A, to moderate it, B, to prevent any harms coming towards us, and, and C, to ensure that there is sensible, rational, rational conversations in that particular grouping. BRICS, for that matter, BRICS is another matter altogether. We are a founding member. Uh, and uh, let me confirm to you that uh, on that table, when the expansion was being uh, discussed, the largest list of countries uh, that was proposed by any country was by India. India wanted the largest number of new entrants, uh, contrary to popular uh, 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 perceptions. And uh, 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 the idea of bringing more people in uh, was to actually uh, strengthen the grouping in a manner in which the right kind of actors with resources and names could participate, okay. or those sit on certain important geographies could contribute. And uh, uh, if you look at the new entrants, you would not find many who would not be equally comfortable with the G7 uh, as they are with the others in the BRICS grouping. So the countries who have come in are not polarizing figures or polarizing uh, uh, countries. They are all countries who are going to contribute to the bridging role that these emerging geographies must play. They are right after the Indian mold, where uh, we believe that we need to be in as, as many groups as possible because there are going to be some countries, including the US, including India, including a few others like China and Japan and others, 
who are, who will have to be in multiple uh, uh, smaller arrangements so that we have a cohesive larger world order. Okay, last question, Ian Bremer. I interviewed uh, Farid Zakaria a couple of days ago and one of the things he said about American politics is that no matter who wins, America is headed most certainly into a state of political crisis. Uh, he spoke of how if uh, Donald Trump wins or loses, uh, there is likely to be chaos. So given uh, where you sit, could you share with our viewers your reading of what's most likely to happen in America putting on uh, your risk hat right now? Look, um, I, I mentioned that no one's looking forward to this election, uh, aside from perhaps America's adversaries. Uh, it is very likely that this is Biden versus Trump redux, uh, the two uh, incredibly uh, old and also uh, pretty unpopular uh, leaders. Uh, and uh, right now they're polling about even. The latest polls show 45 to 46 uh, if Biden versus Trump, uh, which means that we have no idea who would actually win. Um, Trump has is more unpopular with independents. Uh, we also know uh, that we have 91 indictments uh, against a twice impeached and twice acquitted former President Trump. Everything about this election that is negative is unprecedented um, in U.S. history. And uh, it, no matter who wins the election, uh, the losers. Um, and the losing side is going to feel this time around that the election is illegitimate. Um, meaning if Trump wins, the Biden supporters believe that he shouldn't even be allowed to run given the crimes that they believe he's committed. If, Trump, if Biden, Biden wins, Trump of course will rally his supporters yet again to say uh, this was stolen, this was rigged, and he's going to be facing potential jail time. This is all horrible for the United States and of course for those that rely on the United States. My final point is that India, at least India, is one country that we know has a trajectory of good and improving relations with both Trump and Biden. So at the bilateral level, at least as long as Modi is there, it does seem like the US election will have less impact on India than it will on many other countries and many other democracies around the world. Ian Bremer from New York, uh, Kishore Mehbubani from Singapore and uh, Samir Saran from New Delhi for lighting up this G20 International Roundtable with the depth of your insights, the breadth of your perspective. Thank you very much. India is aiming big with the G20 Summit, so we thought the India Today group should do the same, set up a high-quality international roundtable and I think the kind of insights you've heard over the past hour would be very difficult to find on any Indian or, for that matter, international broadcast. So thank you to our guests for making this so special. I'm slipping into a break. We'll have more for you on the other side. Stay with us. want to condemn that minister from Tamil Nadu because he has exposed himself. But question is whether Congress party will be still in alliance with DMK. These people are anti-Hindu. They do not like Sanatan. They do not like Hindu religion. Regarding whether Sanatan Dharma good or bad, that I don't want to join the debate with him. It has, uh, it was there from 5,000 years ago and Sanatan will be in India till sun and moon is there. Weather forecast now. 
Delhi, maximum 40 and minimum 28 degrees. Mumbai, maximum 31 and minimum 26 degrees. Kolkata, maximum 31 and minimum 24 degrees. Bangalore, maximum 23 and minimum 21 degrees. Chennai, maximum 32 and minimum 26 degrees. Hyderabad, maximum 29 and minimum 22 degrees. Fresh row has erupted between the AAP government and Delhi LGBTQ Saxena this time over what AAP is calling shivling like fountains that have been installed in the national capital ahead of G20. AAP has accused the Delhi LG of hurting Hindu sentiments. Here's a report. As Delhi gets up to host the G20 summit, the Aam Aadmi Party and Delhi LG, VK Saxena are at loggerheads over shivling shaped fountains which have been installed in the national capital. AAP has objected to the installation of these fountains and accused Delhi LG, VK Saxena and the BJP of hurting the sentiments of crores of Hindus. Delhi Minister Saurabh Bharadwaj sought an apology from the LG calling shivling shaped fountains an act of sin even seeking an FIR against the left -hand governor. VK Saxena said that fountains are not shivlings, but art pieces made by an artisan from Rajasthan. Shivling ko is tarah se chorahe pe laga dena aur uska fuwara ya jharna bana dena LG sahab ne paap kiya hai aur us paap ka unhe prashchit karna chahiye. Is tarikhe se dharmik aastha ko इस तरीके से हिंदुओं की भावनाओं को आहत करना मैं नहीं समझता कि कोई अच्छी बात है वो शिवलिंग नहीं है वो आर्ट पीसेस हैं अगर उसमें किसी को शिवलिंग दिखाई पड़ता है भगवान दिखाई पड़ता है तो बहुत अच्छी बात है मुझे इसमें कोई आपत्ति नहीं है लेकिन कंट्रोवर्सी मैं समझता हूं कि ऐसी कोई होनी नहीं चाहिए the national capital is getting all decked up to welcome about 40 country heads on September 9th and 10th. Ravi Kanan, a seasoned oncologist, has won the prestigious Maxese Award 2023 for his contribution to the health sector. Years ago, Dr. Kanan left his home in Chennai to work amongst the people of Silchar to fight cancer. He's our good news today's story. Dr. Ravi Kannan, a renowned oncologist and a hero for holistic healthcare, has helped hundreds of underprivileged cancer patients avail treatment. 
Assam based Dr. Kannan, who has been awarded the Padma Shri, has won the Ramon Magsese Award 2023 for his contribution in the health sector. Award is a sad hospital in which are so much as colleagues have made it. Our society is a very good citizen. We have a lot of mother. So, the main thing is that we have to do this. ह्यूमन कोलैबोरेशन का ये रेक्टिफिकेशन है। In early 2000s, Dr. Kannan visited Assam as a guest surgeon several times. His life was in Chennai, but after meeting Kalyan Chakrabarti, the head of the Kachar Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Dr. Kannan decided to help people of Silchar fight cancer. But a bigger battle was awaiting him: myths about cancer. People would come for consultation, but nobody wanted treatment. In 2012, Dr. Karnan performed first surgery and proved the patients can win against cancer. इतने साल हो गए किसी ने मेरे से नहीं पूछा आप क्यों आए हो किसी ने नहीं पूछा आप इधर के नहीं हो कभी भी always look at what will benefit society अपना benefit देखेंगे तो इतना मजा नहीं आएगा but आम कम्युनिटी का मेडिकल में बेनिफिट देखेंगे ना तो एट द एंड ऑफ द डे बहुत सुकून मिलेगा बहुत सैटिस्फेक्शन मिलेगा। टुडे डॉक्टर कर्नल्स हॉस्पिटल इन सिल्चर इस कंसीडर्ड वन ऑफ द बेस्ट फॉर कैंसर सर्जरीज। ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट इंडिया टुडे Presented by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. Co presented by JK Tire Ranger Series, stay wild at heart. Co powered by the new Kia Seltos, the badass reborn. Co powered by policybazaar.com, her family hogi in short. Co powered by the bold look of Kohler. Good evening, hello and welcome. You're with the news today, your prime time destination news. Newsmakers, talking points, the big talking point. Uday Nidhi's talent in the heart of a big controversy. Is he guilty of hate speech? Is this the DMK's critique of Sanatan Dharma and Hinduism justified? Among our other guests tonight will be the Congress leader.